Welcome and good afternoon to the 2020 Modern Workplace Summit. We appreciate all of you being here. And while we're getting to know each other, why don't you pull up the red level box that you were able to get for registering early. You've got your red level notebook, so you can take notes. If you're feeling a little stress, you have a stress ball in there, some putty to play with. Need a drink, feel free to grab one in your brand new red level cup. Need to doodle, you've got some markers as well as, an, as well as a mouse pad in order to doodle on. If your screen's feeling a little fuzzy, feel free to go ahead and give it a clean with the red level cleaner and cloth. Next up, we have today's agenda, and it is chock full of great sessions from great presenters and an even better panelist today. First up, we have our keynote panel, Real World Case Studies Moving Forward in the New Normal with Mark Smoda, the Detroit Institute of Arts, and Vista Maria. That will be on this current leak. Our afternoon sessions, so our two o'clock session, our three o'clock session, and our four o'clock session will have a separate Teams live event link to be able to join. So you should have an email with both of those, but you will also get another email after this session is over with the link to the further afternoon sessions. Next up in the housekeeping items is if you would like to ask a question, and we would love to have your questions, please use the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will hold all questions until the end, and we'll be sure to get to as many as we possibly can. If we have not had a chance to get to your question when we run out of time, I will be sure to follow up with an email and reach out to our panelists to make sure that we get all of the information over to you as soon as we possibly can. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's panel moderator, David King, the CEO of Red Level. So David is the Chief Executive Officer of Red Level. We are a Novi based IT services and consulting firm serving clients throughout Michigan and quite honestly, throughout the Midwest. David founded Red Level in 2004, having identified a pronounced market need for a firm capable of providing enterprise grade IT services and solutions to small and medium sized companies. Under his leadership, the company has expanded to over 50 staff members and has been the recipient of honors and awards bestowed by leading business publications, technology partners, and community, community organizations. Without further ado, I turn it over to David King. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, before I get started, I wanna take a, uh, just a quick second and thank our, our marketing team, uh, Megan and Christy here at Red Level. Uh, for pulling this all together, uh, especially in the virtual world. Uh, last year, we had this event at the Microsoft office down in downtown Detroit, and we got to see a lot of a lot of the folks that were registered today and some new people as well. So we're going to to use our technology and again, our team's technology to um, to get started with the Modern Workplace Summit uh, 2.0. So this is our second year hosting this event. Uh, last year was such a success that we obviously continued to extend that and wanted to bring you some more case studies of some real business leaders here in the Southeast Michigan region that we've worked with that their story is just inspiring. And as, as humans, we all connect with stories. Uh, I think you're going to find the panelists today very insightful, uh, energetic, and uh, certainly knowledgeable about their industries and how they digitally transformed their organizations. Uh, none of them are new to their organizations. They didn't walk into this uh, problem midway through it. They've been at their organizations for a number of years. They've seen the struggles and they've really persevered over the last several years. So with further, ado, without further ado, I wanted to introduce our panelists today. And I'm gonna talk about each one individually in the organization that they come from as we, as we go through this. So uh, our first panelist today is Brian Johnson and Brian is a sales leader at Mark's Moda. And Mark Smoda is, sorry, I'm just forwarding the screen here. Um, it's been a member, he's been with the uh, Mark Smoda sales team since 2011. And Brian is responsible for the overall client experience, acting as the key conduit between all stakeholder groups to ensure project teams stay in alignment around their partner's long-term goals and aspirations. He can be counted on to take big ideas and translate them into tangible action plans, driving value for his clients, such as Michigan State University, Consumers Energy, and Peckham Industries. 
Our second panelist today is Katrina Wright. And Katrina Wright comes to us from Vista Maria where she's a senior technology man information manager. Um, she's responsible for the strategic direction, project management, software configuration, business intelligence, help desk management, and maintaining vendor relationships. So in addition to her job duties, Katrina de de devotes time to the um, leader of the Green Group, which aims at reducing the agency's carbon footprint, is a member of the Christmas Committee, which ens ensures all residents have a magical holiday, serves as a current member and former chair of the annual Dolly Drive event to benefit foster care youth, and is a trauma response implement practice trainer. Katrina started her career as a business analyst for ACN and has spent time in business intelligence leadership at the Pulte Group, Workforce Software, and Trinity Health. Most, most recently, Katrina spent a year as a senior consultant in the service of the Boeing Company. Again, a little bit actually about Vista Maria. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Vista Maria, uh, in 1883, five sisters of the Good Shepherd arrived in downtown Detroit to the Ward Mission on Fort Street to establish the first home and carry out their mission of fostering restorative relationships and delivering innovative care treatment and education so that the vulnerable youth and families believe in their worth, heal, and build skills for success. The need was great and quickly grew to 33 sisters and over 200 girls as a young, as a young woman. Through the generosity of the Ford family, the sisters were deeded 50 acres of land on West Warren Avenue in Dearborn Heights for $1 and immediately began taking steps to build residence halls, a school, a, a powerhouse, an auditorium, gymnasium. On December 8, 1942, the House of the Good Shepherd officially opened with the new name Vista Maria. Over the years, Vista Maria has evolved to serve a variety of needs for vulnerable youth. Today, Vista Maria is recognized as the best in class residential and community based treatment and therapy for children, young women, and their families with the vision of all children, families, and communities achieve success through continuous learning and relationships that promote personal, professional, and family well being. Vista Maria looks to, looks to its future as a healing resource center, which will ensure, ensure that children and families within our communities have access to critical services and care. And lastly, rounding out our panel this morning is Richard Scott. So Richard Scott is the technology leader for the Detroit Institute of Arts. He's responsible for the technology and vision and strategy at the DIA and in introducing modern innovative technology solutions. Rich and his team have re-architected and modernized the infrastructure at the DA and have been migrating as much as possible to the cloud. Rich and his team were instrumental in developing and launching the first augmented reality tour in the world at the DIA. Rich began his career as a developer and eventually moved into various leadership roles to become a trusted technology business partner and leader. He's worked in the financial services, consulting, and nonprofit industries which have given him a broad view to architect technology for many different use cases. So most of you are familiar with the DIA here in, in town. Uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts is the town square of our community, a gathering place for everybody. Founded in 1885, the museum was originally located on Jefferson Avenue, but due to its rapidly expanding collection, moved to its current site on Woodward in 1927. The Bow Arts building designed by uh, Paul Cray was immediately referred to as the Temple of Art. The museum covers 658,000 square feet that include more than 100 galleries, an 1,100 seat stadium, a 380 seat lectoral recital hall, and an art reference library and state of the art conversion, converse, con, conversation services laboratory. And DIA's collection is among the top six in the United States. With more than 65,000 works, the foundation was laid by William Valentier, who was the director from 1924 to 1945, and acquired many important works that established the framework of today's collection. Among his notable acquisitions are Mexican artist Diego Rivera's Detroit industry fresco style, which, Revere, which Rivera considered his most successful work, and Vincent Van Gogh's self-portrait, the first Van Gogh painting to enter a U.S. museum collection. Wow, such such amazing stuff at the DA. Well, with that, I wanted to get started with our panelists today. We've got a great group of people, and all of them, again, <clears throat> pardon me, as I mentioned, 
have been going through a digital transformation. And I want to get started today with uh, Brian, Brian Johnson from Mark's Moda. And Brian, you've been with the organization Mark's Moda for a little while. Tell us a little bit about Mark's Moda and how you got started on your path with Mark's at, for your digital transformation. Sure, Thank, thanks Dave and, and thanks to everyone on the call. Certainly I am delighted to, to be with everyone today and certainly more than a little excited to uh, to talk about this this topic. What I what I particularly like about technology is the the ability to to help both both internal and external stakeholders drive drive value. So this is this is fun for me and it's exciting to see that the work that you can do um, really produce a positive outcome. So at, at Mark's Moda, we're a contract furniture dealership. We support Herman Miller, they're a large manufacturer in West Michigan. So we kind of support them and work with them in Southeast Michigan and the, the, the greater Lansing area as well. A big thing that we do is we help customers articulate their long-term goals and aspirations for their real estate and, and manifest that into a, a full-fledged floor plate of, of office furniture. Historically, that process has been fairly manual. We have designers, we have project managers, we have tons of notebooks and pens and papers. We do work in CAD and we print that information and on, on large uh, plans. And um, what we've, we've realized or, or tried to do is to digitize more of those processes. So we probably started that journey um, with some sincerity, I'd, I'd say early 2017. And that was a consequence of, of our, be, our partnership with Office 365 and, and starting to see what was possible there. We started using tools like Microsoft Teams. We started using tools like Microsoft Planner. And a big thing that we were trying to do then and still working on now is how do we keep teams in alignment on the important things that are happening? So when you're writing it on paper, the visibility company-wide because uh, we have offices um, in Livonia and Lansing and in Detroit, that can be hard to do. But when you make it digital, it's easier to keep um, the important things in, in front of all people. Um, so that's that's David kind of where we started and, and certainly we are making and, and continue to make refinements since then. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Katrina, how about you? Where, how, how did you get started on this? And I know that you were, you were with Vista Maria uh, for a number of years and then took took a, a short hiatus and came back and and then you saw some of the changes that were going on so where where were you, where did you get started at um i would say vista maria's journey probably began close to 10 years ago when they brought on ceo angela oftenberg um, she came from a business background rather than a nonprofit background and i think really started to transform um, the way the agency thought about some of its administrative practices um, she in turn brought on uh, CFO Kathy Regan, um, who we had a history of working together in the past. And I joined um, the organization um, a little over five years ago. Um, and when I joined, uh, you know, there's very little cloud services, very little integration, um, a great hesitancy of um, almost fear of technology. Um, and I think, you know, again, it just comes from, you know, being an organization that's been around for, you know, since 1883, um, you can imagine that change, you know, happens a little bit more slowly. There's a lot of tradition. There's a lot of, um, you know, leading from the heart. And in the last six years, we've done a lot to, you know, help employees overcome that fear of technology. Um, we've worked with um, great organizations like Red Level. Um, I think we have a relationship that's close to 12 years with Red Level now. And, you know, really working together to understand what is the foundation that we need to lay. We were doing a lot of that before I left the organization in 2019. Um, in 2019, when I did that consulting gig, I worked in a fully integrated Office 365 environment, and I was just blown away at the possibilities. I was in Teams all day. I was having conversations. I was collaborating. Everything I needed was at my fingertips. Um, so when I came back to Vista Maria, I was very excited to get them on that journey, and I saw you know, the next couple years, you know, I had a two year roadmap to get everyone into teams and excited about digitally collaborating. Um, so that's kind of how our path started, um, you know, just bringing on, um, you know, different people with different, um, you know, viewpoints of how you can lead a technology organization, even at an agency 
where technology is not the most important thing. Um, you know, our client care, our relationships with our constituents are the most important part. And now it's, you know, we're starting to realize how technology can make all of that relationship building easier um, through collaboration in platforms like Teams. And really what that's done is that um, it, um, you know, prompted us to, you know, invest in more infrastructure. Uh, Red Level just recently helped us with a really large investment replacing um, all of our core switches and access points and took our users from getting, you know, 20 megabytes per second to 50 megabytes per second. I have people telling me almost every day how much better their experience is. Well, that's 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 amazing because, you know, once you start on that digital transformation, you certainly can't go backwards. <laughs> yeah. And what knowing a lot about Vista Maria, uh, you guys are, are, are historical planners. So that you sometimes have to plan years in advance because of grant money uh, yeah. and budgets that you guys really take the uh, digital transformation very seriously and, and really think things out. And um, and just like that, and also the DIA, you guys are not new to digital transformation at all. You, Richard, you've been in the digital transformation now for a number of years. Um, maybe kind of walk us through what got you, where you started with the DIA and where that, um, how you got started with the DIA in that area. Sure. Um, so yeah, six, six years ago at the DIA, there was no IT team. Um, we had uh, a couple of contractors that, you know, were, were basically taking orders from people and there was no strategic um, vision or use of, of technology across the museum. Um, so that led to a very, very siloed use of technology at the DIA. Uh, there's very few, very few little uh, or little integrations at all. Um, there's quite a few network failures that were happening uh, and we only had 10 megabits per second bandwidth for over 300 users at the museum. So you can imagine how slow internet connectivity was. Um, and Katrina mentioned uh, uh, fear of tech and that there was a little bit of that at the DIA. I mean, people were especially fearful of the cloud, um, but we embarked on a, on a journey um, to make the appropriate infrastructure upgrades to prepare us for for cloud computing, um, and over the years we've we've you know rolled out Office 365. We're using Office 365 broadly, although we hadn't. We can get to this later, but we hadn't really embraced Teams yet. Um, but uh, we're on our we're on our way to embracing Teams more fully. Um, but we've uh, built many integrations, moved everything that we can to the cloud, um, and now you know we're in a pretty good position. Um, to support people uh, with what they're doing today, working remotely, right? Absolutely. So speaking of uh, 2020 as, as a year of transformation, again, we don't need to talk about the, the current situation in the world, but how, uh, when we were talking about uh, in preparation for the panel, we, we talked about how many of you, the three of you on the panelists um, had plans for 2020 as you laid out uh, the end of your end of the year for 2019 and how many of you were exactly following that plan for 2020 so and and uh, obviously the answer was resoundingly zero because everybody's had to make adjustments so if you can think back Katrina we'll start with you if you think back towards the end of the, or beginning of this year um, where was the organization at you know right when the pandemic started and how did you how did you start to leverage um, from a digital transformation perspective well, um, you know, when the pandemic started, the first thing we needed was just more VPN licenses. We, you know, for years had been living in a world where, you know, maybe 10 to 15 people worked from home on a regular basis and they didn't work from home during the day. They just worked from home at night to catch up on things or maybe on the weekends to catch up on things. Maybe if they were sick and stayed home, they would work from home, but we didn't have any truly, you know, work from home employees. So, you know, kind of overnight, we had, you know, between 30 and 50 employees that went to working from home full time. So Red Level immediately got us, you know, the number of VPN licenses that we need, gave us an alternative to VPN so that, um, you know, as we were kind of standing up that infrastructure, making sure that people had the connections they needed. And then, of course, just the collaboration space, you know, just being able to see your coworkers and talk to them. and. That's where my experience with Teams really helped is I was able to say, let's try this. And 
I had already tried to put the bug in people's ear about how awesome Teams was, and I had started a little Teams pilot group. But um, you know, once we actually launched it to everyone who started working from home, it just went like wildfire, and everybody wanted it, and everybody loves being on video. I'm not a big fan of it, but um, but I like it because it just shows how personable our organization is. Everyone likes to see each other. They like to collaborate with each other. Um, you know, we re previously had a three-year roadmap to get to the cloud, to get off of our file share and into the cloud. I think that roadmap is shortening. Uh, teams are just starting to move themselves into the cloud. They're realizing that if they have files in Teams, they can get to those files anytime they want. Whereas if they have a file on the share drive, they first have to connect to VPN and then they have to get to the file share and it's a slower experience. Um, especially because people who are working from home are using their own bandwidth. They're not using the bandwidth of Vista Maria. So it's almost what it really showed us is we've always been very cautious about rolling out new technology to our users. And we've always taken a very phased approach, very small groups move small groups of people at a time. And because we were afraid of, you know, the response to change and what it's been really um, eye opening for us is that when you kind of when there's no other option, when you have to change, um, people kind of like it better. They, you know, everyone loves teams. Everyone wants it to work. And now we're starting to look at, you know, replacing other legacy systems, um, you know, things that are outdated or non upgradable. We're, you know, the the caseworkers are starting to realize that, um, you know, technology is important because the longer it takes you to log case notes because, you know, maybe today you have to go to four different systems to, you know, log a case note for a child because we have four different systems that capture different things that might take 30 minutes. Whereas if we had a technology solution that might take five minutes. And so what the pandemic has really done is just kind of forced that mindset of all of our users to shift drastically and now they are starting to see technology as a friend uh, rather than an adversary. Oh, well, that's so true. Well, and, and, and Richard, you know, think about where you guys were uh, at right around March when things were starting to change because you already had a, a number of initiatives underway. Um, talk about that and, and where, you know, what, how the organization adapted. Sure. Yeah, we, we, uh, we had a, a project that we were just getting kicked off that was actually supposed to um, prepare uh, various different departments across the organization for a broader use of teams, uh, for example. Um, we we hadn't kicked it off yet, uh, but at least we had you know the prep work done um, to, to uh, launch that project. Um, we also were heavy into the upgrade of Windows 10 and that stopped immediately. I mean, we basically dropped everything to focus on people's ability uh, to work efficiently while while virtual, while while at home, right? Um, all of a sudden then uh, we had teams working, but we hadn't really provided training on it, but everybody started using teams. I mean, there's it's there's nothing like a, a pandemic and people forced to work from home to get people interested in using a new tool that allowed them to be able to facilitate those kinds of collaborations that they needed to. Um, so then we, we you know, basically uh, dropped the Windows 10 project. We didn't start executing on the official Teams project. We were basically just supporting people's use of Teams generically uh, because we were forced to work from home. Um, you know, as I said before, we'd done some prep on moving a lot of things to the cloud, but um, not everything was in the cloud. So we also had to, uh, you know, take a look at how we could get people connected to a couple of applications that remain on site. Um, we set up a, a pretty uh, unique that I, I'm not going to be able to describe uh, effectively. My, in, my uh, infrastructure manager would have to describe it exactly what he did, but came up with a method that would allow people to connect to those applications remotely while making sure that, you know, we didn't provide any security problems uh, with them doing so. So we had to get that all set up. And then, you know, we had staff, even though the, we did, weren't accepting visitors, we had to have staff that were coming into the building 
Um, so we needed to, you know, come up with a process and procedures to support that. And that's where Red Level, uh, you folks came in uh, with the ClearPass application. And that's been wonderful for the DIA to allow um, our staff members to feel, you know, safe and in, in, in coming into the office and making sure that, you know, we're, we're paying attention to, to, you know, the health concerns that everyone has. Um, and then, uh, you know, all of those, all of those other projects that we, that we were going to execute on. Now we're starting to ramp those back up. So we're starting to work on the Windows 10 rollout again, um, and we're getting ready to to kick off formally um, a much larger project to use Teams in a much broader way than just for meetings and these types of things. To use it for file management and true collaboration uh, between teams and departments. Great, great, thank you. And, and Brian, you mentioned earlier that uh, Marks Moda started the transition, their digital transformation in around 2017. Um, prior to the, right before the pandemic started, where, where were you guys at in that journey and, and how have you seen that kind of continue? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And, um, you know, certainly we, we were not starting at zero, um, but, um, you know, our, our kind of perspective is we're never going to we're never going to be at the finish line. We're always going to iterate and we're always going to look for for ways to to improve. But we've known for a while there are two kind of key things we're we're looking to we're looking to solve. So one would I I would say um, I might be making up a phrase here, but I, I wonder if folks on the call are seeing this too. I, I kind of call it this convergence of expectations. So it's it's our industry, which is contract furniture expectations are, are being set from folks that historically we've we've not had anything to do with. So I'll give you an example. If you buy a, a pizza from Domino's today, you're going to get a text message when uh, that pizza hits the oven. And quite frankly, I don't know why anyone needs to know that, but now when I buy that pizza, I want to know, is it in the oven yet? Um, and so so folks are, are bringing those those expectations to us. I'd also say the way Amazon so fluidly handles the logistics of in, in order and then getting it to its end destination. Folks, folks expect that. So, so we're aware, we know we're not different. And you know, our challenge is how do we use technology to, um, um, to help in that process? I'd say another big thing we've been aware of for, for a bit is um, there's just more data now. There's more information to manage than, than ever before. And quite frankly, I think that's universal. So what you can't do is, is use tools of the past to try and manage expectations of the future. Um, you, you have to get in sync in that regard. So as we've, we've iterated from, from 2017, you know, we've, we've leaned very heavily on folks like Red Level and, and certainly um, you know, Microsoft within the Office 365 platform to find the types of solutions that exist within that space to drive those, those outcomes. What's interesting is, you know, COVID has brought tremendous change, but in this particular example, so expectations which are increasingly digital and data that is increasingly growing, I think COVID only reinforced that. Um, so I, I think our challenge, all of us on the call, is what, what are we going to do about that and how do we use folks like Red Level to, to, to help solve that? I think I think everyone here has 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 stepped in and created new innovative solutions, which we're going to talk about here in, in just a second. Uh, but, but before we get there, um, something that was interesting, but all of you said that you really had to to kind of take a step back and get people working uh, back earlier this year. And there was this whole push to work from home and, and some of some of the organizations were already doing it. Some of them were in the middle of it. Um, but certainly that was a big change for for every organization to really continue to operate as best they could with, with those tool sets. Um, but that, but again, that brings up the concern of cybersecurity. So maybe, um, Brian, how about just picking that up and say, you know, how did Marks Moda handle their cybersecurity concerns with a completely remote workforce? Yeah, another, another good question. So I should say, you know, I'm, I'm one of our sales team leaders, so I'm, I'm usually more on the customer side of things than, than the back end side. So there's some things that that our IT team would be better at answering, answering, but certainly we have noticed, um, you know, what seems to be a substantial increase in in phishing attacks via email. So we have partnered with uh, other folks, Duo Security in Ann Arbor is one to really think through like a, a multi-layered 
a security protocol that is paired with Office 365. In general, that has gone well. We, we've had some hiccups with, with users and getting them set up, but um, it's a must. You have to do it. You have to be thinking security first. And, um, you know, that's one of the big ways that we've we've tried to do that as folks are, are working all over Michigan at this point. Surely. Um, Katrina, you mentioned you're using a tool as well to kind of help manage and, and mitigate some of the cybersecurity threats. Uh, maybe tell us how you're handling that now that you've got more of a remote workforce. Yeah, so for years we had been, um, you know, teetering on the decision of whether to implement no before. Uh, we had done a baseline phishing test in 2016 that showed us, um, I think over 50% of our workforce was um, liable to click on a phishing attempt. And we knew how important it was, but the price tag at the time was um, just not tenable for us. So we decided to try and address it through internal means with some quarterly communications and some trainings and some reminders to the leadership team. Uh, but, you know, when the pandemic, you know, I think it was probably two weeks after the pandemic hit, um, Red Level was really sharing a lot of critical information with us. And, you know, one of the things that was trending at that time was, I think it was like a 600% increase in phishing attempts. And, you know, once we saw that, and we already knew that our workforce was at risk for that, it really sealed the deal on us purchasing No Before. We launched that in uh, April, and we've seen a 10% decrease in phishing, um, you know, uh, employees that are liable to click on a phishing attempt since then. So we're using that platform to do, um, you know, practice phish attempts. We're assigning training to people that click on those phishing attempts. Um, and in addition to that, we also found that it's really just a really nice learning management tool. And we were able to, um, you know, we saw such great engagement from our employees uh, with that tool and learning about cybersecurity that we started to push out other training modules uh, related to new software releases and related to new processes on campus. Um, specifically around our visitor management system. And so we really not only got this great cybersecurity tool, but we also found a learning management system that is so accessible that our users are actually interacting with it. And we haven't seen that before. We've we've had trouble. And I think a lot of that too is also, you know, the work sh the work force itself is shifting. Uh, you know, we have an entry-level position on campus, and like a lot of entry-level positions in the world, there's a little higher turnover rate in that um, in that position. And we're starting to see, you know, the millennial generation and younger, they've been on their smartphones their entire life. They don't know a time without a smartphone like some of us older folks do. And they're really expecting everything to be online. Um, you know, one of our key points that we're working really hard on right now is getting employee schedules online. Uh, you know, a lot of employees are coming in, they have that expectation and we um, can't fulfill it yet. Uh, so that's one of our major projects that we're working on. Uh, but even going back, you know, to the security thing, in addition to the launch of No Before, um, I did mention we also upgraded our visitor management system. Um, and that really controls all the physical security on campus. So upgrading that technology, providing our security guards with um, a nicer platform, as well as launching No Before are the things that we've immediately done to help increase security. And now that leadership is a little bit more engaged, we can um, you know, turn to partners like Red Level and say, okay, what's the next level? Like what's the next step we need to take to keep our organization secure? Right. And, and Richard, you're, I think you're also using a similar tool to help uh, manage your cybersecurity um, with your remote workforce. Um, in addition to that, tell us how you, you handled the, um, what, what additional means did you go through when you were analyzing how to, how to handle this, this change for the business? Sure. Yeah, um, actually we have no before as well, and we've had it uh, in place for about three years. Um, and just a little bit about that, it's a great, it's a great anti-phishing or phishing training tool, if you will. Um, we started out, uh, uh, you know, doing uh, mock phishing attempts against our staff members uh, with fairly easy um, to spot uh, phishing attempts through this tool, no before. Uh, and we, even with, the, with them being fairly easy to spot and after we had already provided training also through no before, um, you know, we were at a 25% yeah, fishing prone uh, staff 
Um, now, over the years, by by continuing to to fish our staff members on a monthly basis and continue to to increase the difficulty level of the messages and to continue to provide training to staff members on what to look for in emails to identify that they're their scams um, or phishing emails. Um, now we're at the highest level of, of uh, um, difficulty with the phishing emails that go out. And we're down to, I, I think last time I looked, it was like six or seven um, percent phishing prone, even at the highest, most difficult to spot uh, phishing emails. So it's been great. I mean, we've really made some fantastic improvement with staff. We, so we already had that in place, but we're, you know, very, um, very concerned about information security at all times. I mean, I I have to report out to our audit committee annually, on, um, um, you know, what our largest risks are, and you know what we're doing uh, to to prevent attacks in in any way that we can, uh, or to mitigate those risks. Um, and with the pandemic, obviously, you know, with people working remotely, we have to be conscientious of the fact that in many, many cases they're using their own equipment at home and we have no way of, of knowing how that equipment is protected, right? Um, for, in addition to that, um, those people m might need to, you know, connect in not just in a cloud way, but connect directly to DIA resources. Um, that presents a big risk. So uh, I mentioned earlier we had developed using Azure, Microsoft Azure, we had developed this um, mechanism, if you will. It's a VPN. It, it, it uses VPN, but the users are not VPN, not doing a VPN directly to our DIA systems. It's kind of like our own private VM in the cloud, if you will. Uh, they're, they're using a VPN to connect to Azure. That, that Azure instance then uh, allows them based on their privileges to connect from there to a system at the DIA. So it obfuscates um, our internal systems from the DIA's user's laptop or home computer by one additional level, uh, again, in an, in, in an attempt to provide additional protection from potential risks to our uh, internal system. So, you know, it's something that we have to think about. And it, when you when you switch directions like that, um, you know, you have on the one hand, as Brian said, there's expectations, right? People have expectations of what they're going to be able to do. I'm being told to work from home now, IT, you're going to have to provide me an ability to do that and be able to do everything I need to do. And then you also have expectations from the audit side and the in the business leaders, you know, the the um, director of the museum and, and the board of directors, they fully expect us to be safe, right? So um, you have to marry those and come up with a solution that that's a win-win for both. And that's what we've been trying to do. Yeah, I imagine that's that's probably similar to a lot of a lot of our participants today of trying to figure out how do they marry the business requirements as well as the technical requirements. And uh, cybersecurity, I always say, is like an onion. You just you have to peel all the different layers, and there's no one size that fits all. So you have to really look at all the different options and, and put those pieces together. And it was really interesting how you shared, Richard, about using really the the Office 365 or the Microsoft platform, using different pieces and parts for that to really customize a solution for you. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you use use the use the tools that you have and supplement. Uh, where needed, but like you said, that that onion can be peeled back in so many, many, many layers. Um, and and frankly, information security is something that you can never be comfortable with. You've never done enough. You have to assume that you've never done enough. Um, you've always got to be looking for additional opportunities to protect yourself. Certainly. So, Rich, I'll stay with you for another, our next question. Um, if you can look back to the earlier this year. And, and really point to one thing that, that you were planning on um, that really had no uh, involvement in, the, in our pandemic, but really aided the organization in, uh, in essentially navigating through that. Either it was a technology or a plan or, or something that the organization was, was doing that really you look back now and say, you know, I'm glad we were doing that 
that really helped us get through this? What, what would that be? Well, honestly, uh, there's two things, uh, Dave. The, um, the fact that we had already um, embraced Office 365 in a pretty full way, we we're using SharePoint broadly, we we're using OneDrive broadly, um, you know, that that was a big help, right? Because many, many people, not everybody across the organization, but many people across the organization had already adopted um, OneDrive and many had already started been using SharePoint for the their collaboration files with their departments, right? Um, not so much cross departmentally, but intra department, they were using SharePoint quite a bit. So that helped immediately out of the box. We have a, we have all that stuff, much of it in 0365, but not not everything, as I said. The other thing is we had already gone through the project um, actually that your team helped us with to plan on the rollout of teams more broadly. So we already had an understanding of where we were going to go, right? What we wanted to do. And as I said, we were getting ready to kick that project off, but we already had a plan in place and knew how we wanted to execute going forward. That preparation put us in a position that we could provide additional support to our, our end users, even without the more formal project having started yet in their use of Teams because we knew where we were going. Um, so uh, those two things just by happenstance, right? I mean, we, we didn't do those things preparing for a pandemic. We did those things because that was part of the direction that we felt we needed to head in as an organization for the future. But that really, I think, put us in a position uh, that we were better prepared, I think, than we otherwise could have been uh, when the pandemic hit. Certainly. And Katrina, you, you also did, you relied on teams as well. Um, and I'm not sure if you started that journey before or if you're in the middle of it um, when when it um, when it started. But what is that the is that the one thing that you would point to, or what else, would, or what would you point to to say that you know we're glad that we were already here uh, when when we when the pandemic struck? I would say the thing that I'm glad that we did the most before the pandemic struck was really more of a culture change and really making IT more accessible to employees. Um, you know, bringing IT out of the basement and having more interactions with employees, um, being proactive about technology solutions and really making people comfortable with technology. I think all the work that we did on that in the five years leading up to the pandemic is really what helped us the most because um, teams, we were, you know, I had 10 people in teams the day before we got ordered to stay home. So, you know, teams, we weren't there. We had, you know, some people playing in it, but there wasn't, you know, anywhere near like agency adoption. But I think the fact that we did so much work to establish relationships with technology and make it not scary is that really allowed people to be open to whatever solutions we were going to suggest to help us get through um, the work from home situation. And now that people are understanding how powerful it can be, they know that they that there's an open door and that they're able to come to us and make suggestions about how to make their lives easier. So I think it was more the groundwork we did from a culture perspective that helped us more than anything. Okay. And, and Brian, uh, Mark's Moda really worked on, on an application to help more um, uh, data analytics and transparency to your to your end users. Were you working on that prior to the pandemic or was that something that kind of came out of out of uh, a need for for that? Brian? That was weird. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you now. Oh, that, that was that. No, we um, we were dreaming about that before. And, and what I've observed with technology is you, you learn new skills and capabilities. And to Kachina's point, when you make a cultural transformation too, some of this stuff builds. So in our pursuit of, of managing information better and putting customers in the driver's seat of their information with us, we started to use um, SharePoint, we started to use Microsoft Planner and, and try and connect those, those two, two things. So just like when um, 
you know, you would order something on Amazon when when we're helping, you know, a customer with their their corporate real estate, they there are certain pieces of information that they want to have access to. They want to know when their their product is scheduled to arrive. They want to know uh, installation dates and, and things like that. So we were able to um, connect that information directly with um, certain customers. And what happens? I mean, I mean, the big thing is um, we've seen substantially less emails. So some of the cool things, whether you're talking about Teams or even other tools, is when you can redirect certain types of, of communications to more appropriate formats, you can substantially enhance you know, people's work like balance um, and even get information to folks faster. I, I think the thing, you know, you know, COVID has been so tough on so many people. We are very fortunate at Mark's Moda that, that um, and, you know, not to sound like a broken record, but we started this this Office 365 journey so so much earlier. I mean, I can remember um, being in our, our corporate headquarters here in Detroit and having a conversation about the possibility of uh, basically shutting our offices down, everybody working from home, and there was no necessarily timetable on that. And then, like a week later, we we made that trigger. So for us, um, you know, I, I do want to echo Richard's sentiments. The fact that we digitized a lot of our processes and made those visible to folks through Teams and um, our ability to embed certain applications within that, that tool enabled us almost overnight to work from home and not, and not, miss, a, not miss a beat. I think the other big thing is, uh, you know, tools like Teams make communication um, very easy and very fluid. So I, I'm like Katrina, I don't like to do video. I usually avoid it when I can, but but the fact that we can do that and that's available um, easily, phone calls are, are easy, has just been um, such a godsend in this this crazy time. Yeah, and, and Brian, I'll stay with you on this one. And you know, from when you, when you look at the company as a whole, um, what would you say has changed? You know, if you look at the company, is it the culture? Is it the mindset? Are people um, far more collaborative? Or wh wh where would you say that the organization is? Um, wh where's the biggest change at? Yeah, I think I think quite frankly, folks are excited. You know, when you start to see how learnings and capabilities can compound and drive value, both for yourself and for your customer, that's 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 pretty exciting. Um, so. You know, I'm not expecting that, that things are going to get better with, with COVID overnight, but I would say that we are very bullish on the future and, and what's going to be what's going to be possible when you when you work with folks like Red Level and you you get serious about your, your hopes and aspirations and what you want to do with the tools that are available. Um, that's a that's a fairly empowering feeling, I would say so. Um, you know, probably the biggest thing for us right now is just we're, we're staying positive, we're staying focused, and we're confident that that if we invest and in, in, in work together in this way, good things are going to happen for us moving forward. Right. Absolutely. And Richard, you know, what, what would you say about the DIA? Um, what changed the most uh, for you guys? You guys introduced some new technology, you introduced some new services, you did, a, you really did a lot during this uh, pandemic. Yeah, we have. I mean, you know, when the pandemic hit um, for the DIA, especially when you start start thinking about what it would look like for the DIA to reopen, um, you know, simple things get complicated, right? Um, so simple things like just entering the museum, that's that becomes very complicated um, and wandering through the museum. That's more complicated, right? I mean, in the, in the situation that we're in. So um, you know, and even even tickets, right? So, uh, you know, general admission tickets that prior to the pandemic, we just expected people to show up. We didn't sell general admission tickets to the general public um, online prior to the pandemic. Um, but, and there's various reasons for that, and I'll get into that in a minute, but, you know, we just expected people to walk through the door, walk up to a guest sales associate, you know, do a transaction in person and come into the museum. Well, with, you know, we couldn't open under those conditions. So we initially opened with just free for everybody. The DIA was just free and we we put just plain free tickets online. Okay. 
um, we had never been able to to sell tickets online because there's no ticketing system in the world that would pay attention as I think everyone on the call probably knows the DIA is supported um, by a tri-county millage that was passed and you know as part of that millage we we have responsibilities to our tri-county residents and one of those is our tri-county residents are free outside of the tri-county they you know those folks outside of that tri-county region there's there's a charge for admission to the dia there's no ticketing in, system in the world that's going to say oh you're in oakland wayne or macomb county so you get to come in for free oh you're outside of wayne oakland macomb county we have to charge you ticketing systems just don't work that way so again we we uh ended up uh coming to you actually red level to build a front end that connects to our back end ticketing system that would pay attention to people's location that would allow us to then um you know provide free tickets to our tri-county residents and to charge appropriately to people outside of those uh those counties so you know it, it you know you think about it and it, initially it's like well it's simple just you know if if someone lives in 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 macomb just don't charge them well on, in your head you know like our cfo or you know our director of the museum it, saying that sounds simple but there is no system to do that so we had to have it built and i really do appreciate red level stepping up and building that little web app that we're using that communicates with our back-end ticketing system to allow us to do that the first day it went live i i uh, sent an exciting email to my cfo and said hey we made 256 dollars today you know you send back that's great that's 256 dollars more than we had yesterday because obviously it's been a struggle for the dia um during this pandemic um you know and then there's you know everything's touchless we have touchless admission you get your tickets online you have a qr code you walk into the museum and we have kiosks with nobody no one no one's manning those kiosks you scan your qr code it gives you a message welcome to the dia um or depending on whether you're early or late because we only allow so many people per half hour and some people may arrive before their time it might tell you oh can you come back in 10 minutes right but it it's all touchless um you don't touch anything you just scan hold your ticket up in front of the in front of the camera on an ipad and you get a little message that um you know says oh welcome to the dia coming in whatever you don't have to engage with anybody everything at the dia is touchless and then um lastly i, I don't want to take up too much time but we have the we're getting ready to launch we pulled everything at the dia is pulled down that uh, required touch so we had response stations where people were prompted for a response to a thought provoking question about a gallery that you're in right and typically what we used to do was have people actually write their responses on a on a piece of paper or a, or a, you know some you know uh, uniquely shaped card or whatever have you and drop it in a box well you can't do that anymore um, so we had to come up with a way that we could provide those types of response stations digitally in a completely touchless way um, and again, that's something that that you folks at Red Level have helped out with, and we're getting ready to launch our first digital response station at the DIA. So, um, you know, we've been we've been busy. We've changed course um, quite a bit from what we had planned on doing this year, but it's all been good. All of these things are are improvements that aren't going to go away. Yeah. COVID could end tomorrow, and we're still going to use them. Yeah, you stole the words right out of my mouth that you know that you've taken advantage of of the uh, the time to really make some long term changes in the environment. I think all of us here on the call are are, are regional, um, and we've all been to the DIA. And just imagining ourselves back at the DIA now and how we would interact with the exhibits. I think I appreciate you sharing, you know, kind of the new way of of how the museum is operating. So I think it gives us a perspective of, of still coming back, sharing all the great experiences there, but in a new new modern way. So I think it's it's pretty amazing how the um, the DA has pivoted and taken advantage and, and going to keep a lot of these systems in place long term that I think will ultimately be in, in the organization's benefit. 
I mean, ultimately, we want to, Dave and, and everyone else, we, we want everyone to feel comfortable coming back to the DIA, right? Mm -hmm. So we're doing everything that we can um, to make people feel comfortable coming back to the DIA. Again, as you mentioned in the opening, you know, we consider ourselves the town square of the metropolitan area. And and we recognize that, that you know, there's a great deal of uncertainty that COVID has presented to all of us. Um, but we want to make the DIA that comfortable place for people to come in a safe place for people to come as a as a respite, right? So the, that's why we're all of these things are great things that we probably would have started doing in the future, but we pulled them forward um, during COVID so that so that we could make sure that people were comfortable coming back to the DIA. Certainly. And Katrina, you've you've done a lot and seen a lot uh, yourself as, as a leader of the organization, along with Kathy and Angela, have really done a lot to navigate this with, within the organization. What, what would you say has been the biggest change that you've noticed at Vista Maria? Um, I would say um, support of technology is one of the biggest things I'm feeling. Um, you know, as a nonprofit, obviously, we want to spend as many of our dollars on our client care as possible. And so what that means is historically, we've depended on grants and donations. I'm sorry, my dog is <laughs> making sounds in the background. Um, we've, you know, relied heavily on grants and donations. And, um, you know, we end up with a network that can be challenging and difficult because, you know, we have, you know, four Cisco switches and two Dell servers and one of this. And, you know, we have, um, we just did a count, we have 37 different types of um, laptops. And so really, you know, one of the biggest things that I've seen is just that support for investing, um, you know, dollars into the technology space. So I mentioned earlier, you know, we just got done with that really big infrastructure project. So now all of our switches are the same. All of our access points are the same. We have a cloud portal where we can manage that ourselves. Um, and so just getting that support and understanding of the importance of technology now that people are more reliant on it. Um, that's been, you know, one of the biggest things, but then also to speak to things that, you know, Brian and Richard have both brought up, um, you know, we use Microsoft Planner a lot now. Everyone loves it and how it can, you can use, you know, Power Automate to generate tasks when they're due every month. Um, we're using QR codes at our front gate, have a touchless um, experience for people coming onto campus now, where before you'd have to hand your driver's license to a security guard and there was a lot of touch involved in that process. Um, the importance of data analysis is it has always been very important, but now is becoming even more important and more supportive, um, especially, you know, we're a healthcare facility. We have to do contact tracing um, for COVID cases and things like that. And we were able to quickly do that, um, you know, in our software. And so we're also looking at um, text communication. We've had a really big emphasis on talking to our employees during this time of um, unrest. You know, there's a a lot happening in the world and it was very important to us to have personal touch points with all of our employees. We did that during the month of August. We sat down um, with small groups of employees and asked, you know, questions and made sure, you know, how's your mental health? How's this? How's that? Um, how's communication? And one of the things that we resoundingly heard back is that um, people don't want to check their email. They want, if there's a critical communication, email is not the path. And so this month we're launching um, textedly, which is a way to send critical text messages to all your employees at once. Um, and so it's really, again, support collaboration um, that I think are the pillars, but we also get to use all this cool technology to support that. <laughs> wow, that's that's quite an undertaking. And that, that actually goes right in my next question. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, Katrina. Um, the future, what does that look like for Vista Maria? And you mentioned the texting program that you're rolling out, but I, but I know that we're getting into the end of the year planning and, and we're really going to all sit down and start talking about strategy for 2021. And it's certainly going to look different than we, we did this last year. So what, what would you say that, um, how, do you, how do you think that's going to look for you guys this year? Um, we're still, you know, a lot, you know, focused on infrastructure because we know that, um, you know, even if we, you know, launched Teams Voice tomorrow, if your laptop is 10 years old, you're not going to have a great experience. So we're really looking at, you know, we've remediated our, you know, switches and access points. We're now going to look at replacing um, hardware for our employees, making sure everyone has that really great experience. 
Um, you know, finally upgrading to Windows 10 and say that with a little hesitation because we're still on Windows 7. Um, and then also, you know, looking at those legacy systems like our phone system to see, you know, where we can make those improvements and really relying on, you know, Red Level as our partner to say, you know, what is the next best step so that we get to that truly integrated, um, you know, cloud experience where, um, you know, it becomes effortless. You know, you move from from one application to another and you're in the same conversation and everyone can follow. Um, you know, I think that's where we're going, and but we're still going to focus on infrastructure first. And we actually just recently got some feedback, um, you know, because again, we're having these, you know, courageous conversations with our employees that, um, you know, we need to, you know, maybe take a step back on uh, pushing new technology. And so that really just um, really made us know we were going in the right direction by focusing on infrastructure first, um, you know, making sure that the engine is good because you know if you're putting all kinds of cool oil in if the engine is bad it's just gonna it's not gonna work so that's where that's where our plan is right now but you know living in the world we live in we're ready for anything we're ready to pivot whenever we need to well that sounds good there's just so much to do some days and, and you guys certainly have your handful there uh, managing and maintaining your, your clients as well as uh, transforming in the midst of all this um, transforming with with 2021 in mind, certainly there's going to be a lot to do. Um, Brian, how about you? W where is Mark's Moto going, and where do you see the future? What are you guys talking about for for 2021? Yeah, so a little bit like Katrina, I, I would say we're kind of always in a state of of focusing on infrastructure. In in our world, we're increasingly using more sophisticated and robust platforms. One is, is kind of proprietary to our industry. I don't know if folks have heard it. It's called CET. We're using tools like AutoCAD and those increasingly need um, updated piece of hardware to handle. We did just move, I'd probably say within the last quarter, our ERP system is officially in the cloud. That was a heavy lift. Um, so we need we'll keep doing those things we have cultural things we need to get folks used to, to using the cloud and that's that's going to be ongoing i think the thing that i'm most excited about is actually the work that, that we've done with with red level so red level helped us move from a, a version 1.0 customer dashboard to a, to a version 2.0 and what's really exciting about it is it's it's been designed in a way where I don't want to say it's like copy and paste, but it it, it should be should be fairly close. So I, I I know I sound like a broken record now, but this this whole idea of managing data and putting customers in the driver's seat to receive that is is huge for us. So we are we're creating a tool with Red Level that enables a large um, multi-state healthcare um, organization to be able to access their entire workflow with us to see. Um, uh, the different types of things that, that they have ordered and where those are at. And we've enabled, uh, you know, abilities to, to uh, request different types of information from us within a digital experience. So we're, we're probably near the finish line to roll that out within the next 60 days. And as we, um, um, as we go, we think what we found is kind of a, a universal expectation. And the intent is that for our other large customers in the region will deploy um, similar tools. Okay, absolutely. And Richard, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, wrap with you here. Oh, we got actually a couple more things I want to ask, but um, what does 2021 look like for the DIA? You know, we're, hopefully we'll get back to some normal levels of attendance and and uh, services, but what are you guys thinking about for, for that and, and bringing technology in to, to keep the, um, the organization going? Sure. Um, well, we're going to complete our Windows 10 upgrade, like like Katrina mentioned. <laughs> uh, we started it, but no, didn't finish it, so we got to get that done. Uh, we're going to execute. We're going to kick off very soon that project that had been delayed to roll out more uh, broadly the use of Teams um, to you know support the collaboration and communication um, cross departmentally at the DIA. Um, and for several other uses as well. But you know, the big the big focus at the DIA right now is on digital engagement with our visitors, right? Both inside and online, right? Um, as an example, uh, we just opened up a new exhibition called Ofrendas um, to celebrate the Day of the Dead. 
Um, and that's our first exhibition that we're offering a virtual 360 experience online. So you can go on the DI.org website and find that and take a look at it. But things like that are what, you know, are, are on people's mind um, at the DIA. And, you know, we, as I mentioned, we still have a couple of applications that are on-prem. And one thing that the pandemic has demonstrated is that, you know, trying to support and provide access and, and um, you know, functionality to, to our end users that use those applications has been very difficult. So we're going to, to see if we can come up with our own um, methodology for hosting those applications potentially in the cloud. Because, you know, there are some applications that are used at the DIA that just are not available um, as a cloud application. So we're thinking that we're going to have to create our own private cloud um, methodology for those applications and in part of the what we've done in the pandemic has set us up to at least begin doing that and then we're very interested in exploring power apps and power bi to provide ad hoc reporting capability to our users uh, for some of the applications that really don't have good ad hoc reporting capabilities currently so you know more integrations and that type of thing um, and then you know i mentioned the online but in the museum you know, everything that used to be, that used to involve touch in the museum, we're not stopping with the response stations. So we're looking at gesture controls and that type of thing for some some engagements within the DIA that we, we had to remove because they were, you know, if you have to press a button, we're not gonna allow, have you do that anymore. But what are the other ways that we can have visitors come to the museum and launch an experience without having to touch anything? So we're going to be exploring all of that stuff too. Wow, so many new things coming for 2021 for the DIA. Um, lastly, Richard, if you could sum up in three words um, the pandemic that you guys have gone through in the last, what would 2020 look like in three words? Uh, let's see. Um, I forget what my three words were yesterday, so I'm going to come up with a new three words. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, challenge, change, right? Um, and collaboration. I think those are, you know, um, first of all, obviously it was a challenge initially. You know, you have to accept the change that that is thrust upon you, right? And and step up to that challenge, right? Um, and you know, be prepared and open to collaborate with your your internal resources and external resources to help you um, address address the change that was needed, right? Certainly. And um, Brian, how about you? Uh, three words, if, if there is such a thing as three words, because the year has been been such a crazy year for all of us. How would you how would you sum that up? Yeah, that's that's funny. When you start to think about it, it's, it's hard to find just just three words. But I, I liked what Richard said. I, I'd say personally for me, probably my three would be get it done. Right. I mean, we're at where we're at. There's only one way to go, and that's forward. Um, I think we have a good idea that technology is important. We need to invest in it and we need to, to embrace um, the value that it brings. And, and so certainly within our organization, I, I, I talk about technology all the time. So we're going to get it done. We've got to dream big and, and, and make things happen in the future. No good, no, good choice of words. Well, what about you, Katrina? Uh, I'm going with don't get comfortable because I think we all know that our lives, um, you know, change is, is our natural state. And this year is just showing us how quickly that change can come upon us. And so um, I don't think there's room to be comfortable anymore. I think you always have to be looking for ways to improve, um, looking for ways to collaborate, looking for ways to change. Certainly. If, if I were to contribute, I would say COVID changes everything. So I, I got to give a great kudos and thank you to the staff at Red Level for just being resilient, being flexible. Uh, we have a lot of parents that are, are juggling so many things at home. They're still trying to uh, support our clients and they're really working almost some, in some cases uh, week, weekends and around the clock to really juggle all the different things that we they've had to, um, that have been thrown at them this year. And uh, the company has grown. We've done some great things when we've added a number of new employees this year and services. So we, we've also had to pivot and change change along the way. So 
Um, with that, I think we are at the end of our Q&A, or we're going to just begin our Q&A session now. And I'm going to turn this over to Megan to um, see if we have some questions for our participants, um, for our panelists. All right, thanks, Dave. Yes, we've had quite a few questions come in while you guys were talking. Great information. Thank you again to Brian, Richard, and Katrina. Um, for those of you who have questions, feel free to use the Q&A panel um, that is on your screen, and we will do our best to get to every single question that we can, but in the event that we do run out of time and we need to head over to our next session, we will be following up with the panelists to make sure that we get all questions answered as soon as we possibly can. So first up, um, given all the challenges that 2020 has presented to everyone, how is this impacting your end of the year planning? Who wants to start first? Um, I can take that, Megan. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, we're, we're really just being very thoughtful about our roadmaps, engaging with our partners and um, having, you know, much more discussions about about budget um, and we're in a little bit of a unique position because not only is the pandemic affecting us, but um, there's a new director of um, human services in the state of Michigan and she's bringing forth some really fantastic um, clinical changes to um, our care models and things like that. And so we're not only making adjustments um, from a pandemic standpoint, but also just, you know, other um, adjustments. So I think really it's just, um, you know, much more planning, much more analysis, much more um, to, you know, Brian has spoke about it, just that importance of data and information. So really um, being called upon to, you know, use those skill sets and help the business um, drive the correct path for next year. How about you, Brian? How are you guys planning for the end of the year? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just such a such a fascinating time and no doubt how we thought 2020 would go has has not proven to be the case. Um, you know, in, in terms of where we're at, um, you know, we're working quite closely with our, our customers. Obviously, when you, you have a scenario where people uh, to some degree cannot be together and our business is about creating effective environments for people to be together, that changes the, the game plan. So uh, it, we, we are all in on digital and thinking through how do we interact with, with our internal and external stakeholders digitally? What do we expect that will be in the future? What are some of the trend lines, both in terms of customer expectations, in terms of how our, our customers are, are working and, and operating and iterating together? So I don't I don't have a great answer yet because we're we're still we still need more of the data to to come in, but we're we're certainly asking a lot of questions and we're certainly um, probably more integrated, more sticky with customers now than than ever before. Everyone is is trying to answer, I think, the same question, which is what's what's next? What's the new normal? Absolutely. And how about over at the DIA, Richard? Sure. So the DIA, our fiscal year actually ends in June. So when you think, you know, I, in answer to your question, I'm going to talk about the end of the calendar year. Um, and we have a lot of um, several, we have several really cool exhibitions coming up. So we've been doing a lot in preparation for those. And obviously, again, making changes, um, you know, due to the pandemic. So um, everything we do now, we think about in a different way, right? So as we prepare for those exhibitions, and, and I'm going to put a little plug in, you guys got to come down to see Detroit style. We call it cars. Um, we completely deinstalled our entire contemporary gallery, and we're going to have cars on display in the contemporary gallery at the DIA for this Detroit style exhibition. And it's all about car design, and it's going to be awesome. But you know, as we think about you know exhibitions or anything that we do in the museum, we're thinking about a how can we do that in a touchless way, but most importantly we're thinking about how can we anything that we do to engage with our visitors how can we do that digitally and how can we do that better right um in a digital way um so it really has us focused on on digital going forward in every way possible right um there's you know because th there's 
all kinds of things that had to stop at the DIA and and we want to start we want to start moving forward with some of the things that we had stopped, right? Um, and some of those are going to require us to think very creatively about how we can offer those things digitally. We're already using Teams Live Event, similar to what this event is, uh, to engage with community members uh, in various different ways. We're going to expand on that. We're going to see how far we can push that envelope um, and and continue to engage with the community in every way that we can uh, in a safe way. OK, um, definitely love the idea of having the cars in there. I can't wait to get down there. And I'm going to stick with you, Richard, on this next question. Has any one cloud technology been key to getting through the challenges of 2020? I, I mean, again, I, I've got a point to, I mean, the entirety of Office 365, right? Everything that is in Office 365. Um, because, because it is a cloud application, it provides all the collaboration tools, and that, that to me that includes Teams as well, right? So you have all of the collaboration tools that you need that are accessible in the cloud. In a in its it's out of the box, it's safe for me to have you know, our employees use their home equipment to access Office 365. Um, and Microsoft is wonderful to to nonprofit organizations. And, and frankly, I, I can't, I don't know what the rules are in this, what I'm about to say for, for uh, for-profit orgs, but, you know, we can, with our licensing with Office 365, our, our staff members can install um, the Office suite on, up to five, I think it's five home machines, right? So uh, they can actually install Microsoft Office on their own machine and they can engage at home with OneDrive. They can sync OneDrive, they can sync SharePoint libraries, they can do everything at home that that they could do in the office, right? So that has been, that has been the one thing that has been a godsend to us that we had adopted that that whole suite of applications prior to to the pandemic. Katrina, did you want to take a take a stab at this question? What is the one cloud technology that has really made a difference during the pandemic? I just I couldn't agree with Richard Moore. Um, you know, Office 365 or Microsoft 365, as I know they're trying to get us to I'll call it now, <laughs> um, especially for nonprofits. They are just amazing with what they offer to nonprofits and what you can get at low price, what you can get at low cost, um, you know, like, you know, Teams, you know, is just changing the way we collaborate with each other. I am a, a huge Power BI user, so, um, you know, that is really, you know, the core of what we do to get a lot of our key metrics to our leadership team. Uh, you know, just Outlook, you know, just that way of staying in touch. So I just couldn't agree with Richard Moore. Microsoft 365 is a, a, a phenomenal um, platform. Okay, Brian, I'm going to tee this one up for you. New question. Teams versus Zoom. Pros and cons. Is there room for both in business? Oh, I, I, I certainly think there is. I mean, in eight months, I've learned more about Zoom and Blue Jeans and WebEx. And, um, you know, I, I think all folks are, are, are all these organizations are, are making strides to make um, onboarding and integration fairly fairly seamless certainly you know uh, my bias is for teams and you know mark's moto we we do all of our meetings through that that platform but there there's definitely room there there's definitely room for both i you know somebody asked me what would you recommend i'm, I'm obviously going to recommend teams i think there's a security component there that i really like but um you know we have large uh, large organizations in Southeast Michigan that are using blue jeans to to collaborate with different folks and we have others that are all in on Zoom. So there's 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 a room for all of them. Okay. Another question that came in, the importance of mobile devices and apps has been mentioned just a few times. How is each organization managing these devices to ensure the user and org's data is secure? Katrina, do you want to start with that? 
Uh, sure. So we actually um, recently got rid of our MDM solution because it was very cumbersome. Uh, and so really how we're controlling it right now is, um, you know, we're, we're encouraging people, we're shifting them to the right app. So we're shifting them to use the Outlook app for your email, don't use your native, your native app. Um, we don't have a ton of our business files in the cloud yet, so there isn't a lot that people could draw down that need to be protected, but we're definitely recognizing the importance of it. And so that'll be one of our initiatives is to find an MDM solution that works for everybody, um, you know, that keeps things safe, but also is user friendly and doesn't require a 30 minute installation process and uh, things like that. So right now we know that it's a need, but we're not um, as concerned about it because of the level that we're at in our journey. Fair enough. How about you, Richard? Sure. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure the nature of the question because I had talked about using iPads for people checking in at the museum and that type of thing. Um, we're, we're encouraging people as they come into the museum to use their their own personal devices, right? Um, so that response station solution that I had talked about earlier, uh, I didn't really describe how you engage with it, but you're going to be able to either use your own mobile device to send a text message response to a number that you see, right? Or you can scan a QR code and use Microsoft Forms to put your response into a Microsoft Form or type in a tiny URL and also go to a Microsoft Form and put your response in that way. Um, so we are encouraging people to use their own personal devices to engage with us within the museum. Now, when you talk about using personal devices um, like a, a laptop or a, or a tablet or your phone, um, we've allowed people to do that um, for years. Um, and we don't put an MDM, we don't really have an MDM that we use for that, like as Katrina had mentioned. Um, we do also, like Katrina had mentioned, encourage people to use the appropriate applications for providing that access. And and I, you know, people accessing their email on, it's mostly email. People, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of other things that they would put on a mobile device that at the DIA, it's really, it's really just email or Teams. Um, and in both email and Teams, especially with the no before cybersecurity that we do, um, and as safe as we've gotten with our people being able to identify phishing scams, um, I don't see that as a huge risk um, at the moment. So, you know, the in the in the museum, we're encouraging people to use their own devices to engage with things there. The the, the devices that we have within the museum are completely touchless, where they're the DIA's equipment, right? So again, you scan your QR code. There's no touching. No one can touch it. No one can do anything with it. Um, so, you know, I think I think we're pretty safe in that regard. So again, I wasn't sure exactly what the nature of the question was. So hopefully I answered it to um, however the person intended. All right. Thank you so much, Richard. Brian, what are your thoughts on it? You know, honestly, I'm I'm probably in general going to, to to pass on the question only because I would not be our our lead expert on our security processes. I'd have to bring somebody else in to to do that. Um, I mean, it's important. I mean, you definitely in today's day and age, you need you need experts, and I'll be the first to admit I'm not our expert on that topic. Fair enough. I appreciate it. Um, question around Power BI. Um, and specifically, Katrina or Richard, if you could answer this one. Power BI has been brought up a few times. I work for a nonprofit, so cost is always an issue for us, but wanted to know if there are any free or low cost support for Power BI. I want to be able to push this app with the organization, but really wanted to get a handle on it first. Um, I can take that, Megan. <clears throat> So I don't, I don't know the costing structure for a for-profit, so I can't speak to that, but there are two different levels of Power BI license. There is a Power BI free version and a Power BI pro version. And what I have found is um, the Power BI pro version is definitely necessary for your developer. So if you're writing the report, 
um, you need a, a pro license to be able to author the report and publish it to the Power BI workspace. Um, depending on the sort of features that you put within that report will depend on whether your users can consume that data with a free license or whether they require a pro license. I will tell you that in my experience, I've built, um, I wanna say close to 60 different reports and dashboards for Vista Maria. I have never built one that didn't require a pro license for the user to use it. Um, and so I've done anything from very simple to very complicated. And I have found that the pro license is sort of necessary if you want that interaction with the report in that online space. If you push the report in a more static manner um, using a PDF or you know some other sort of output, um, obviously you don't need that pro license, but if you are you know wanting people to get in there and play with filters and do their own things with the data to get people to be more interactive with it, the pro license um, is the path that I've seen that you, is necessary. Richard, anything to add to that? Uh, not really. I mean, I just confirm what Katrina said. We we haven't really rolled out broadly the use of Power BI at this point, but we've done some investigation, and it appears to to us that, um, you know, we've already been thinking about how many user licenses we're going to need because we're going to need them to be pro licenses because we want people to be able to, again, create some ad hoc reporting and drill down capability. Um, and and I think the only way that we can do what we want to do is by providing those pro licenses. And I I I can't comment on on the cost of those, but with respect to understanding Power BI, and Katrina may may know more about where to access this information. But I do know there's quite a bit of information online about how Power BI works. If if people are interested in doing some investigation around around um, what Power BI is and how it works. And that's all free. And I would just add to that, that um, the Microsoft community, Power BI, I would say two years ago, um, if you were a Tableau user or a Click user, you would not be happy to move to Power BI two years ago. But I would say in the last two years, Microsoft has done just a out of the park home run with Power BI and how intuitive it is how easy it is to use, and with the um, documentation online that Richard just referenced. Um, I, I think anyone can you know, write a powerful Power BI report in just two weeks of learning. And, and I would add one thing, and Katrina brought this up a little bit ago. One of the, you know, when, when you think about all this within the context of how do you manage data, how do you manage information, the ability to leverage Power BI to set triggers, to evaluate data on your behalf and initiate workflow, whether through a, a, a Power Apps application or Power Automate is just, I mean, it's, I, I geek out about it, but it's really cool. It's really helpful. It's very exciting. Well, thank you. 